I bring you greetings, Exorcist fans, and salutations. This is my weekly review for the latest new episode of The Exorcist, entitled Chapter 9, 162. I gotta start off by telling you that this episode rocked. This episode shook the house to the foundations. It brought the house down. This episode was hot. And whatever other colloquialism you want to use, this episode, this episode of The Exorcist brought it. Now, as always, I am going to be conducting an analysis of the episode and putting in my insights for what I found in the show this time. This will not be a straight-up summation. Uh, I will be talking about different things in the in this episode that stood out to me and where I think the show is going, some speculations. So um, if you haven't seen the show for whatever reasons and you don't want to be spoiled, there will be spoilers in this review. So please, if you don't want to be spoiled, go ahead and watch the episode in a repeat and then come back at a later time if you wish and check out my video. Now, I've got a lot of ground to cover. I don't know that I'll be able to do it in the limited amount of time that I have, so I may have to put up a second uh, addendum to uh, uh, to this video. If that is the case, I will do so. Uh, but um, we'll get started here, see how far we get, and then I will upload the results. And uh, if there's a need for a second video, then we'll go forward from there. So let's get started with some things that happened in this episode, because there is... This episode was just too awesome. This was too awesome almost for words. But let's go ahead and try anyway. Now I'm starting off with this morph of Angela's face because this is the uh, beginning before the com first commercial break. And uh, I wanted to talk about this because this is where we actually find out. This is something that I think, uh, this, this is something that I actually speculated on. And I'm sure many of you also probably speculated on yourself uh, from the previous episode, The Grief Bearers. We find out in this scene that Angela did, in fact, make a deal to save Casey's life from the demon. And uh, we see that Angela says when the demon is about to kill Casey, about to break her neck, that, the, that Angela says, take me instead. Uh, this is actually, to me, kind of reminiscent of Father K D Damien Karras in the 1973 movie, making the same plea for young Reagan's life slash Angela, uh, uh, the young Reagan's life when she was actually possessed, when he told the demon, come into me. Uh, it, it, he told the demon to take him instead of taking Reagan, and it did. And of course, we know the result. He dove out the window in an effort to try to keep the demon from taking full control of him, basically killing himself. But this is what Angela does. She doesn't try to kill herself, but this is what Angela does now. She makes a deal for Casey's life and tells the demon to possess her instead. Now in this scene we also find out a second thing. We also see that um, uh, the demons are of course capable of communicating with one another and what does Angela do, the possessed Angela, well maybe integrated Angela at this point, she actually communicates with uh, in, uh, superintendent or, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Superintendent Jaffe, the police chief there on the right, that uh, she is in fact now one of them. Uh, through touch and through the communication of the uh, previous memories where everything is occurring, we now see that uh, Superintendent Jaffe knows that Angela is now one of them and that there is in fact a demonic entity inside of her controlling her body, her thoughts, other things of this nature. So, uh, this tells me that what I thought in the previous uh, episode, in my previous review, that the demon was not in fact exorcised by God or by Father Marcus and Father Tomas and Mother Bernadette uh, in the Grief Bearers. The demon actually, because Angela made this deal to save her daughter's life, the demon just said, let's give them a good show, and it actually put this show on for the benefit of everyone, uh, tricking everyone into thinking that it actually had been purged from Casey when we actually now see that it is not. So the demons now actually recognize one another. The demon that is inside Angela, the demon that is inside uh, Superintendent Jaffe, who we saw uh, possess him in Star of the Morning, and they are now communicating with one another, showing one another that they are in, in league with one another, and that um, 
now Superintendent Jaffe is, of course, providing cover and circling the wagons and will make everything just disappear on the behalf of uh, the possessed Angela and her family and, of course, on behalf of the larger agenda. So we see what's going on here now. Now we understand that there is a bigger uh, issue that the demons can communicate with one another. Of course, we knew they could, but we see that they can communicate with one another and that they can share plans and information. Uh, and now that there's a bigger picture going on, uh, obviously, the demon inside Angela wants in. Okay, so this is the dinner scene where everyone is gathered around the table uh, after Casey has come home from the hospital. And of course, we see that Casey is sullen and withdrawn, rightly so, considering the ordeal that she's been through. Um, her mom's there, her sister's there, her father is there, and, and so is Father Tomas. Father Marcus is conveniently not there, and I think that there's actually a reason for that, which I'll get to a little bit later. But we do see that Casey is rather sullen and withdrawn, uh, kind of um, just folded into herself at this point. And it's because, in part, we know that she can, in fact, sense that there's something not right about her mom. From the very first scene of this episode, we see that Angela is acting really, really weird. She's actually acting very a kind of nonchalant about everything that has occurred. Uh, even the death of her mother doesn't seem to put, to put her off that much. She's acting very uh, unusually happy about the fact that uh, this whole orde ordeal is over. She doesn't seem to have any trauma or any trepidation about what has occurred. Uh, she doesn't seem to have too much of a, I guess you could say, a kind of concern for Casey at this point and what, she, what she's gone through. She's not really consoling her. She's just kind of uh, acting very... Uh, nonchalant about the whole affair. From this whole standpoint, everything that's going on here is really weird. And, I, and you can see that Casey um, sees that there's something that's just off about Angela. Not even, and by the way, when you're looking at this from the other perspective of the other people at the table, not even Father Tomas, uh, not even his supernatural antenna, if you will, are as attenuated uh, to what's going on uh, with Angela. He's just kind of uh, happy the whole thing is over. He's happy for the family. And so he, not being an experienced man, unlike Father Marcus, does not see what is happening. And that brings me to another point. Uh, Henry actually says in this scene, we tried to invite Father Marcus, uh, but uh, nothing happened uh, with that event, of course. Now he says, right Ange, meaning right Angela, um, when he says that. And I began to think, this is just a speculation I have, I began to think that he left it to his wife to invite Father Marcus, but Father Marcus was never invited by Angela. And the reason for that, of course, to me, is because Marcus, out of everyone here, perhaps with the exception of Casey, would be able to sense that there's something way, way wrong with Angela, and he might even be able to sense the presence of the demon inside Angela because of his vast experience with this kind of business. So that's why I think Father Marcus was not uh, invited. And I also think that, you know, obviously Father Tomas's supernatural antennae, if you will, are not yet as experienced as Marcus's as are, and he is not as attuned to what is going on, and therefore that's why he missed what was happening in this entire scene. Now, this is the scene between Father Marca, uh, Father Tomas and uh, Henry, where uh, Henry reveals to Tomas that he has been seeing or hearing the number 162 in his head over and over again for the past couple of days. Now, if I'm not mistaken in the timeline, the past couple of days is pretty much where Angela was basically, well, not repossessed, but integrated, as it were, uh, with the demon. And he, Henry has been hearing these words, these numbers, 162 in his head since about that same time. Now, so the speculation to me is that uh, just as Tomas said in the scene that God spoke through Henry when uh, Tomas was first told about Father Marcus and St. Aquinas. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that once again, I think that it's God or maybe some good angels, if you want to put them in that, those, for, those terms, who has given Henry this clue to be able to pass on to Tomas. Now, we don't know exactly at this point in the story what 162 means, but we do get to the end of it, uh, get to the bottom of it by the end of this episode. So I'm going to reserve talking about it in full for now and come back to it when we get closer to that scene. Now, this is the scene in the warehouse where uh, Angela and the demon that is inside of her, let's call her, call it for sake of, uh, for sake of ease, uh, Angela. This is for the scene where Angela comes to meet with the rest of her uh, possessed demoniacs. And we see in this scene very clearly, uh, Angela is there, 
uh, Brother Simon is there, Police Superintendent Jaffe is there, and so is Maria Walters. But we also see these other demoniacs who are surrounding them. Now, I don't know for certain whether or not the rest of these men are actually possessed. They could just be mortal humans who are in the service of these uh, demons. But we, we do know there are two, two or three things that drop out to me at this scene here, and I want to kind of go over them. Number one, uh, the demon that possesses Angela is actually referred to by name in this regard. And this is something that I think most, most of us probably already knew, but it is actually named in this episode as Pazuzu, the same demon that possessed her when she was a child in the original 1973 movie. The second thing that jumps out to me about this particular scene is that there appears to be a hierarchy among, uh, as Angela refers to them, as, uh, among the firstborn. Now, if you notice in this scene, everyone is made to prostrate themselves before the demon uh, Pazuzu, before Angela. Everyone that is except Superintendent Jaffe. And let's look at that a little bit further. You see that Brother Simon is actually forced to his knees uh, in this scene to prostrate himself, uh, to kneel before Pazuzu. But you also see that Superintendent Jaffe is not made to kneel before her, Angela. And I think that that is because, as you see in um, Christian lore, as you see in other um, mythologies that are talked about in terms of angels and demons, there is in fact a hierarchy, there is in fact an order of rank in uh, the angelic order, in including a, in the fallen angelic order. And so it appears that uh, Pazuzu is somewhere, at least in some area, some kind of notoriety of rank that is higher than that which the demon that possesses Brother Simon, and perhaps maybe, maybe either equal or maybe not, uh, maybe just below uh, whatever is possessing uh, Superintendent Jaffe. Because as you can see again, Jaffe is not forced to kneel. He is not made to, he is not, he does not succumb to the power of Pazuzu in this scene. Everyone else does, including all of these other priests, whether they be possessed or not possessed. And if they are possessed, that all actually says something about the power of this demon, that it must have some power greater than theirs, and therefore it must be of higher order or higher rank in whatever the fallen angelic hierarchy is uh, than those demons are as well, if those men are in fact possessed. But you definitely see that Brother, uh, not Brother Simon, but uh, Superintendent Jaffe is not forced to prostrate himself before Pazuzu, and I think that's very interesting. I mean, Simon is even forced to kiss Angela's feet uh, at this point, which again tells you something of the power of the demon that is in control of her body and mind at this point. Of course, in this scene, we also see that Angela takes the time to seriously berate and insult Maria Walters by telling her the reason that you have never been chosen for possession or inhabitants by one of the firstborn, as Angela refers to them, is because of her smell of mediocrity and desperation. She does, she reeks of uh, inferiority if effectively. She does not uh, provide a pleasant odor to them of power and potential, the things that the firstborn look for in human hosts. Uh, so, so basically Angela lays, really lays into Maria hard, causing her to feel so downtrodden uh, as to why she will never be chosen to host uh, one, of the, one of the fallen angels. So this makes me ask the question, looking at how Maria Walters takes that in the end, uh, we should ask the question, Will Maria Walters at some point choose to betray, to betray the demons? Will she choose to abandon their cause, a cause that she has worked for probably effectively since she became Mrs. Maria Walters, Mrs. George Walters, that is, uh, and has come into all of this wealth vis-a-vis -vis her husband? Will she choose to betray the demons at this point because she now knows that she will never be chosen to be one of them? Uh, you remember from Star of the Morning, she wanted so badly to be possessed. She cried when the Superintendent Jaffe was chosen to host the next demon or next group of demons who came into this world vis-a-vis -vis the Volcari Pulveri ritual. Will she choose to betray them now that she knows she will never, ever be chosen by one of the firstborn to be a host? I think this is a question worth asking somewhere uh, down the line. We may actually see something like this go on.
Of course, she will probably pay the price for that betrayal if she does do it. But will she do it? I think there's a possibility here that she might just consider that. Of course, here we have uh, Bishop Egan offering the promotion uh, to Tomas to head up St. Bridget's. And we also learn in this scene that uh, Bishop Egan already knows about Tomas's affair with Jessica. And he promises that he will dismiss it, that he will effectively sweep it under the rug, uh, saying to Tomas in this scene that we have dealt with far worse. And I kind of wonder, quite frankly, if that is not in fact a nod by the writers to the fact that uh, the church has in the real world at least dealt with far worse. We all know that the stories of child molestation by priests uh, of, in various parishes across this country and perhaps across the world. But Bishop Egan basically tells Tomas, we can handle that on our end. You just need to handle the woman on your end. But it does make me wonder. The demons have had designs on Father Tomas for some time, and it makes me wonder, and, and you remember chapter 6, Star of the Morning, where Brother Simon asks, I don't see Father Tomas here when, he, when they were at the, uh, the Volcari Polveri ritual, and he wondered uh, where he was, and he wasn't there, of course. But what designs do the demons have on Tomas? Is this part of that design, and if so, to what end? At this point, I'm going to go ahead and conclude uh, this is going to be part one, as I figured. I don't have a lot of time to keep going, uh, so I'm going to conclude this uh, this review, break it off here, and we're going to go into a part two, and we'll hopefully try to finish up from there with this. This is a long, uh, this was a lot happened in this episode. I've got a lot to say and a lot of ground to cover, so we'll break off from here, and we'll start up again uh, shortly. See you next time, Exorcist fans.